What are some cool pieces of evidence that we have that the Bible is telling us the real story? That's what we'll talk about today. The evidence of God's existence and his gift is more than compelling. Pascal, French philosopher and mathematician. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about Josh McDowell, and now he works with his son, Sean. He wrote a lot of great books, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, More Than a Carpenter, Evidence for Jesus, Answers to Tough Questions, and my favorite, A Ready Defense. All great. But I wanted you to know about him because his research and his deep dive into what makes the Bible true is really stunning. And I learned in rereading this, things that I didn't even remember. But you initially see essentially these chains of writings. Because if you talk to my dad or you talk to most people who are atheists, essentially there was the book of Malachi that was written about 440 BC, somewhere in there. And that was the end of it. And then a bunch of people wrote some other stuff, trying to make themselves look good and try to make themselves into the Messiah, whether it was because the Romans were trying to do it or an outcast Jewish group was trying to do it. And all these writings probably took place in like the 300 ADs. But instead, what you find and what I found in rereading this book is there's this consistent writing that was going on. They found pieces of parchment in Egypt. And this was what was really fascinating. It had little tiny bits of actions Jesus took or words from the scripture. And what they think that these things were, were sermon notes. So even the evidence that Josh presents, but now more with recent finds of archaeology, like these notes, prove every day the Bible is more and more true. Where the church started when we say it did, and it continued on from there. There were writings, there were people, there were witnesses. This is not some sort of a made-up breach of history. There is a consistent following. There were people who wrote down stories, and many of them not included in the scriptures because they were found maybe to not say some of the things. Some of them are kind of interesting and weird. There are also historical documents, not just theological ones. You have just Josephus, who was a fantastic historian at that time gave detailed reports of history and mentions people from the gospel. Oh, the Josephus part looks inserted by other people who are trying to promote Christianity, except the Arab translations of Josephus have those passages too. And there were other people. There was writings in the church that went through all these periods of time. But as it stands now, Hebrew is the oldest and Phoenician comes later. And let's talk about some of these people. Clement of Rome was from 95 AD about five years after John died, and he used scripture at his church. Ignatius was 70 to 110 AD. He was the bishop of Antioch. He was martyred for his faith. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. Polycarp, who I just mentioned, 70 AD to 156 AD, disciple of John. He was martyred at the age of 86 because of his devotion to Christ. And people like Justin Martyr, who lived at 100 AD. John, they think, I think, that he died somewhere in around 90 AD. So his parents maybe knew John. There was Polycarp, who was in 115 AD. Clement, who was also around. And Ignatius, 50 AD to 115 AD. And he says, I do not wish to command you as Peter and Paul. They were apostles. This was a guy who lived in the time of the apostles. So this idea that this was all made up well later is completely untrue and that there were all sorts of texts. There was the epistle of Barnabas, not included in the scripture, but it was written around 70 to 79 AD. There was the the epistle to the Corinthians around 96 AD. So I was on an archaeological dig in Israel and they were like, ah, there's a bunch of people here who have a shovel in one hand and the Bible in the other hand, and they're just looking for all the things that are here. They have this opinion that if the Bible said it, we should believe it last. But when you look at some of the writings, there was Herodotus that was from 1300 years before AD. The earliest copy was 900 AD, and that's some 1300 years after Herodotus lived. Horace, 
900 years. Sophocles, 1,400 years. If we throw out the Bible because of any sort of time span that's there, we're throwing out everything. Aristotle, 1,400 years. Aristophanes, 1,200 years. Euripides, 1,500 years. Basically, we might as well throw out classic history of the West because all of them have huge gaps. The Bible, again, has 40 lines that are in contest with each other, and none of them change the meaning of the scripture. One of them is where the end of the Lord's Prayer was a benediction or the doxology. It's not in some of the older versions of Matthew, so it's footnoted. It doesn't change anything. 40 lines or about 400 words are different, and most of that was differences in regional language, compared to other texts, like the Iliad has 15,600 texts that are in question. We would be able to throw out, like I said, everything if we didn't think that the Bible had, just be by the amount of documents we have, the age of the documents we have, is much better than almost every ounce of history we have at all. This doesn't even bring in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which backs up the Bible 900 years in writing. There's also some evidence that Moses wrote the Torah at the time he lived. It wasn't something that was oral tradition and got written down later. It was in writing then. And there's a whole battle going on about whether the Phoenicians invented language or ancient Hebrews. He also mentioned the archaeological dig in Jericho, which I got a chance to visit which was found in 1930 to 1936, quote, the walls were made to fall outward, according to Garstang. Other sites he mentions, and I got to see some of them, was the Pool of Bethesda. This was a ceremonial pool that was founded in like 1888 and is in excellent condition. I never got to see the full pool, but it is huge when you look at pictures of it. The excavation of the City of David was happening when I was there. And you could see parts of it. And each year I went, I went two years in a row, the dig there got bigger and bigger. And now this whole pool system is amazing. The other one is the Pool of Siloam, which would have been what they call the pagan pool. This is tied to the Tunnel of Hezekiah, which again is my favorite thing. But when I was there, they were like, well, we don't really think there's a pool. We see this little thing over here. Maybe that was part of some sort of pool structure. But in recent findings, they unearthed the steps, the whole thing. It is absolutely huge. This is something that was built like in 2,700 years ago during the reign of Hezekiah. And now it's 1.25 acres of space instead of, we don't think this exists. That's amazing. He said that there were Arabic texts in the passage that said, quote, at this time, there was a wise man called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. And those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after the crucifixion, and he was alive accordingly. He was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. Now that was a text that was in Arabic, and I cannot pronounce the name of it. But in English, it would be called the book of history guided by all the virtues of wisdom. That's crowned with various philosophies and blessed by the truth of knowledge. So that was a piece that was written about Jesus from a different culture entirely. And here was what I thought was really interesting. There's the Talmud and the Mishnah, and I'm not going to go into that. Maybe I'll do a whole podcast about what the Talmud and the Mishnah were. But I didn't know this, but the Talmud and the Mishnah refer to Jesus. And most of it is scoffing at him. They call him Ben Pandera, which would mean the son of Pandera. And there was a Roman soldier named Pandera at that time. So they're saying he was the son of a Roman soldier. Because they were all like, oh, well, Mary didn't have a son through Joseph because she slept with somebody else. They're like scorning him. They're making fun of the virgin birth. And people will say that it's even somebody else, someone who was 100 years away, who was named Jesus and was killed and hung on a tree. Okay, well, my point in all of this is that they will say anything to make sure that the Bible isn't true, even if it looks true, even if the evidence suggests it's true. The leaps people take in order to say the Bible is 
completely false. It's amazing. Even on my dig, I'd ask people, well, how come when we find these things in Israel, no one talks about it? All they want to do is prove the Bible wrong. But where it proves the Bible right, we don't say a word. And he says, it's not our job to be a propagandist for the Bible. I'm like, and this is me as an atheist, we're not telling propaganda about the Bible. We're just giving raw facts. Scientists, this happened. We don't see evidence of this. We didn't think this person existed, and now we found out that he did. Just say the facts. There was even more in the Talmud and the Mishnah. Wanted poster that said, if you find Jesus, we're going to stone him, because that was the only punishment they were allowed to give, because he was healing people through witchcraft and, and heresy. So they even had a wanted poster in these writings for him. But one of the comments said, on the eve of Passover, they hanged Yeshua of Nazareth, and the herald went before him for 40 days, saying, Yeshua of Nazareth is going forth to be stoned. He hath practiced sorcery and beguiled and led astray Israel. And then it said, let everyone know, you know, that this is what happened. And when I reviewed this book, there were people who said, hey, I learned something from Jesus in the Talmud. And then there were other people who scorned him. So the, if you get the Talmud and the Mishnah, the idea is that you have a teacher, much like Jesus was a teacher of the apostles, and you would debate back and forth like a particular point. But there were various mentions of it, and it wasn't like it got added later. It was the exact opposite. It got taken out because many of the Jews were afraid that if it was scornful to Jesus in the Talmud and the Mishnah, they would be persecuted for that. So it was actually there and taken out later and now is back in there. But the Talmud and the Mishnah mention him. I mean, that's what's really amazing about the whole thing. He'll go into more evidence, too, about Jesus dying. And what you can believe is he was buried and he was never resurrected. They put guards outside and probably from the Jewish leadership outside his tomb to make sure that no one stole his body because they knew that if someone ran off with Jesus' body, then it, this whole thing would get loose and people would talk about it. So you would have to believe that the guards just took this casually, knowing they'd be put to death if they didn't look out for Jesus. There were, like I said, probably temple people there also looking guard. There was the giant stone, which took many people to roll away. So it's not like something you could sneak out easily and be quiet about. And he just talks about in detail what you would have to believe to think that Jesus wasn't resurrected through mystical means where angels rolled the stone. Because what you would have to believe to think that the body was stolen as compared to resurrection is hard to believe than the resurrection. And the apostles didn't think Jesus was coming back. They were sad. I called it wigged out Saturday because their Messiah just died. But instead, this happened apart from them, not because of them. And he goes into some interesting things where like Dawkins and other atheists will say, well, the church is terrible. They have no moral reasoning. They're just a bunch of saps who, you know, and he'll go in and talk about the actual quotes. And then he will say, you know, that people will also say that the church has committed so many atrocities then how could you believe Christians were following in the will of Christ? And it's absolutely true. There are things that happened that were terrible. And I'm not going to pander about any of it. Of course it was. But they created universities in the Middle Ages, wanted to have literacy for the masses because they wanted people to read the Bible. They built hospitals, orphanages, place for people who couldn't sustain themselves to live. Most charities came from Christian roots. I was reading an article that the early church thrived because they were the only ones who would care for the sick, even the people with the plague. The early church would save babies that were left out in the cold to die. Luther was big into the separation of political power because he saw what happens when the state and the church are the same thing. Before the abolition of slaves, science came directly out of the church. Most scientists we've heard of were hired by the Catholic Church at the time because they wanted to know the nature of the things that God invented on this planet. They wanted to understand it better because they knew they could understand God better. Well, even when it came to Galileo, he's a Catholic scientist. So he was put to death and people were saying that he was meant to recant. But what did Galileo actually do that got him into trouble? He used to speak to the Pope all the time. The Pope was fascinated by the things he was finding. 
But then he made fun of the Pope and wrote this piece of paper, uh, like basically he was debating someone ignorant. I can't remember the exact name of him, but the idea was, I'm a very smart guy and I'm going to debate a moron. And this was in his writing. So basically he was calling the Pope a moron. That was what got him in trouble, was this paper that he wrote in order to make fun of the Pope. The Pope was intrigued by what he said, and I'm not saying he believed everything that Galileo said, but there's more to the story than anyone is told. But it was the church that wanted to know the nature of science. It was not the church that was trying to hide it. And even up to the point of Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, of course, was a true believer in Christ. Christianity has its hypocrites, absolutely, but it doesn't undermine the message of Christ. We try, we screw up, we all do, and we in many ways make our church look bad. But the human institution, it doesn't mean that the message of Christ was untrue. It just means that we do a pretty terrible job of filling it through. He also talks a little bit in the chart about whether all the religions can be right. And Buddhism has no gods. It's about enlightenment. Or Hinduism has many gods, and it's about reincarnation. So there are differences between the religions, so much so that they can't all be the same religion. They are too different. Then there's the whole idea that Jesus was just a makeup of all these sort of Roman and Greek gods and a composite, Mithras and all these other types of ever, you know, everlasting gods. It's not true. These gods were not resurrected. They didn't pay for our sin. They didn't come to be humans on earth. When they said, oh, well, but there were people in Greek and Roman religion who became pregnant from Zeus slash Jupiter and other gods. Well, they were raped by these gods. They were not incarnate in a holy manner. They weren't meant to pay for our sins. These were often mistakes or just, you know, side effects of the gods getting their fun on earth. This was not the same thing either. So again, he makes this very standard case. He even talks about the rare earth. I love the rare earth. Someday I'm going to do a podcast on this book that talks about it. But if we're all like other planets, we would be straight up and down or sideways, and we would have a hot side of the planet and a cold side of the planet. But because we have a 23 degree tilt, we have seasons which makes most of the Earth entirely livable. We have a Jupiter that acts as a giant vacuum cleaner that sucks up all the comets and all the things that fly through. We're at a perfect Goldilocks place from the sun to the Earth. The amount of things that had to go right in order for us to have a habitable planet is amazing. We have a metal core, which most planets like Mars don't have a good enough metal core. So Mars's atmosphere got whiffed off by solar winds. But because we have that iron core, it causes a magnetic shield that protects us. So like I said, he goes through every piece of evidence one at a time when it comes to science, when it comes to the apostles, when it comes to people's common arguments about the faith. You, you, he goes through them piece by piece. And so if you're really looking something to help you with apologetics or give you I don't know, just this idea that mostly what people argue about when it comes to Christianity and the faith, this is a great series of books to get with. He and his son are still active, and his son is working on rewriting most of his books and creating videos, interviews. Books are just amazing, and I wanted to tell you more about them so that you would give them a shot and make sure that you could read them. But my challenge to you is take a look at some of the archaeology that was found, whether in these books or on. YouTube videos, see what has been going on recently. It's not announced very often. There is some research out there like the Biblical Archaeology Review, which is not a Christian source, but does the pros and cons of archaeology done in the area. Doing news review of what's been happening in archaeology when it comes to the Bible recently, I find where it goes against the Bible, it is shouted from the rooftops. And when it goes with the Bible, Mm, it's not heard as often. Likewise, when I find that there is a mistake made, the corrections are never announced either. Like what I was told about the Pool of Siloam and what they found recently, I think it was in 2023, opened it up to the public. There's a war of archaeology going on because for religious reasons or territory reasons, don't want you to know what is found. Or when they found different sarcophagus that they thought were faked, oh, just kidding, it's true. And they found out later 
certain pieces were authentic. I never hear that announced. All of this really inspired me this last couple of weeks while I'm reading this book. So I hope it inspires you too. Please remember that you can subscribe to the podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, leave a review and tell a friend. I hope to get more people listening to this podcast and the Bible in Small Steps. So far, I'm finding it very valuable. I hope you find it valuable too to do the slow roll of the Bible one chapter at a time so we can do a little bit more of a deep dive than picking a passage out here or picking a passage out there like we're used to you know, doing when we go to church services or certain Bible studies where we're doing a topic. Doing the story in context has just been valuable to me. So I hope it's valuable to you. And just remember, our walk through the antiquities, the fathers and mothers of our church, starts with small steps.